morning. As you're turning in your Bible, I would encourage you to go ahead and open up to Proverbs 30. Um, I listened to this several days in a row in the car, and it wasn't until I put my eyes on the text, which sounds like very much like a kindergarten teacher put your eyes on the text right now, um, that it started to make sense to me. So don't just be a hearer of the word right now. Really interact with it as I read through. Um, these are some reflections um, of an oracle. And I imagine this person may be sitting through the teachings of Solomon this whole time, just like we have, and is now reflecting back on it. Um, we're in chapter 30. One more to go. The words of Agar, son of Jake, the oracle. The man declares, I am weary, O oh God. I am weary, O oh God, and worn out. Surely I am too stupid to be a man. I have not the understanding of a man. I have not learned wisdom, nor not that I, not have I, ooh, let me get my eyes right, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? Surely you know. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Do not slander a servant to his master, lest he curse you and you be held guilty. There are those who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers. There are those who are clean in their own eyes, but are not washed of their filth. There are those, how lofty are their eyes, how high their eyelids lift. There are those whose teeth are swords, whose fangs are knives, to devour the poor from off the earth, the needy from among mankind. The leech has two daughters, give and give. Three things are never satisfied. Four never say enough. Sheol, the barren womb, the land never satisfied with water, and the fire that never says enough. The eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. Three things are too wonderful for me. Four I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a serpent on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a virgin. This is the way of an adulteress. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wrong. Under three things the earth trembles. Under four it cannot keep up. A slave when he becomes king and a fool when he is filled with food. An unloved woman when she gets a husband and a maidservant when she displaces her mistress. Four things on earth are small but they are exceedingly wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they provide their food in the summer. The rock badgers are a people not mighty, yet they make their homes in the cliffs. The locusts have no king, yet all of them march in rank. The lizard you can take in your hands, yet it is in the king's palaces. Three things are stately in their tread. Four are stately in their stride. The lion, which is mightiest among beasts, and does not turn back from any before any. The strutting rooster, the he-goat, and a king whose army is with him. If you have been foolish, exalting yourself, or if you have been devising evil, put your hand on your mouth. For pressing milk produces curds, pressing the nose produces blood, and pressing anger produces strife. Thanks, Tracy. <clears throat> well, we are continuing 
are studying the book of Proverbs together this morning, and we are almost to the end. Um, Andrew mentioned last week that chapter 29 was the last of the Proverbs of Solomon, and so now starting here in chapter 30 and then including chapter 31 where we'll be next week, we have the conclusion of the book of Proverbs. And so chapter 30 where we are this week is really the beginning of the end. Um, And so if you're new with us this week, you might have had some passages in mind that you would have expected us to be in this morning, the last Sunday before Christmas. Um, I'd be willing to bet that Proverbs 30 was not on that list. Uh, but uh, we've been making our way through the book of Proverbs together as a church, and so that, that's why we're here. We've been making our way through the book of Proverbs over the last several months, um, and a couple months back, John was working on planning out the, the preaching schedule for the rest of Proverbs, and, and I don't remember exactly what we were doing. Uh, I feel like maybe we were in your car the first time this came up, uh, but John is like, you're, you're not going to believe this, but if we keep going through Proverbs, the pace that we're going, chapter a week like we've been doing, we're going to finish the last Sunday of the year, which means that we'll be in Proverbs 30 on December 19th and Proverbs 31 on December 26th. And and our initial reaction, both of us, I feel like was was like, we can't do that. Like, no, like we can't, we can't do that. And so we talked about like combining some chapters so that we could finish earlier or just like pausing so that we could do an Advent series and then finishing Proverbs up in January but didn't really love either of those options. And so, but but then like as we pulled out our Bibles and started reading Proverbs 30, knowing that this was the passage that would potentially fall the week before Christmas, it's like, what? Like, like, I mean, you get to verse four there that, that Tracy just read. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? Surely you know. I mean, like, we couldn't have planned it any better than this, right? I, like, I wish I could say that we had, but we, this is, yeah, God and his sovereignty has us in this chapter the Sunday before Christmas. And so this is, this is definitely not going to be your typical Christmas sermon. Um, like, if, if you want that, Come on Christmas Eve. Um, it'll be awesome. But uh, in, in a lot of ways, though, we couldn't have picked a better Christmas passage. Um, or maybe, as I was thinking about it this week, maybe it'd be better to say that we couldn't have picked a better Advent passage. Um, sometimes we use those two words somewhat interchangeably, Advent and Christmas, but they're actually two different things. The one leads to the other. Christmas is the joyful celebration of the birth of Jesus. Advent is the season of waiting and longing and preparation in anticipation of the celebration. And so I was reading this article from the Gospel Coalition, Timothy Paul Jones, uh, pastor and professor from Kentucky. He wrote this article a couple years ago. He says this, he says, in Advent, Christians embrace the groaning, recognizing it not as hopeless whimpering over the paucity of the present moment, but as expectant yearning for the divine banquet Jesus is preparing for us. In Advent, the church admits, as poet R.S. Thomas puts it, that the meaning is in the waiting. And what we await is a final Advent yet to come. Just as the ancient Israelites awaited the coming of the Messiah in flesh, we await the coming of the Messiah in glory. In Advent, believers confess that the infant who drew his first ragged breath between a virgin's knees has yet to speak his final word. Like, that's good, Um, and and that's what Advent is all about. It's about setting aside the four weeks leading up to Christmas to stir our hearts with hopeful longing for the coming of Jesus, to experience just a taste of the longing that Israel would have been feeling after hundreds of years of promises of a deliverer to come, and to feel even more deeply our own longing after hundreds of years of waiting for our king to return. Because by focusing on the waiting and the longing for these weeks leading up to Christmas, the celebration and the joy when it finally comes is that much deeper and richer and sweeter. And and just think about how much more it will be when we finally see him coming again. And so God sovereignly has us in Proverbs 30 this, this last Sunday of Advent, and it really couldn't be more timely because that hopeful longing that Advent stirs in us is exactly what I'm praying that this passage will stir in our heart this morning. 
And so, like we've done along the way in Proverbs, we, we're not going to go through this entire chapter this morning. There, there's a lot of good stuff in here, like Tracy just read, but we're going to focus just on the first four verses. And we're going to look at, in those first four verses, how they function as the beginning of the conclusion to the book of Proverbs. And then in that, we'll see how these verses and how they flow out of everything we've studied along the way in Proverbs prepare us for Christmas. So you can see there on your handout where we're headed this morning. We're going to see four takeaways here at the end of the book of Proverbs that prepare us for Christmas. And and so I'll warn you up front, the the first two are going to be kind of downers. Um, You're probably going to be thinking, I thought you said hopeful longing. Uh, But but stick with me, uh, because for the good news to be good, you have to know the bad news first. And not just know it, but, but feel it. Um, evangelist Ray Comfort, he uses the illustration of someone running into a room all excited, shouting, I've got the cure for your disease. Like, if, you're, if you think you're totally healthy, that news probably isn't going to resonate with you at all. Like, you might even think that person's a little bit crazy. But if a doctor has just recently explained this deadly disease to you and showed you the clear symptoms that you have of this disease then all of a sudden you're very interested in that news. Like you're longing for that news. And when it comes, you celebrate. And so that's the goal of the first two takeaways here, to to stir up that sense so that we feel the hopeful longing that we're going to get to in the third takeaway, which will all lead us to the fourth one, um, which all work together to prepare us for Christmas. And so look at Proverbs 30 with me. And we'll see the first takeaway here. Um, First takeaway is this. It's that Proverbs leaves us exhausted by our lack of wisdom. Leaves us exhausted by our lack of wisdom. So so Proverbs 30 here, it starts with a heading that introduces this chapter as the words of Agur, son of Jekai. And so up to this point, going all the way back to chapter 1, verse 1, there have been a few headings like this throughout the book. Um, introducing the different sections of the book. And so at the very beginning of Proverbs, if you remember, we see a heading at the very beginning in verse 1 of chapter 1 that these are the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. And so then if you remember, the nine chapters that follow that heading then function as the introduction to the book of Proverbs. And those nine chapters are specifically written from Solomon to his son, And and what he's doing in those chapters is contrasting the path of wisdom that leads to life and the path of folly that leads to death. And he's pleading with his son then to choose the path of wisdom and to pursue wisdom. And so then at the beginning of chapter 10 is where we find the next heading in the book. And that tells us that starting with chapter 10, verse 1, are the actual Proverbs of Solomon then. And so from there really through the end of chapter 29, where we finished up last week with a few subsections in between, are just hundreds of these short, wise sayings called Proverbs that we typically think of when we think of the book of Proverbs. And so those wise sayings, and what they're doing is they're they're illustrating and fleshing out the path of wisdom, the path of folly, in all kinds of everyday, real-life situations. And so that's what we've been walking through together for the last several months now. Well, now then, there's a new heading here um, at the beginning of chapter 30, and it's somewhat significant because it's marking off a new section, and it's doing that by doing something really significant by by naming a whole new author. Um, So verse 1 here in chapter 30 says that these words in this chapter are from this guy called Agur, um, the son of Jekai. And so if you look ahead then real quick as well, um, flip over to the beginning of chapter 31, you'll see one more heading like this that introduces one other new author for the final chapter of the book. And so I'm not going to steal too much from next week, but just to, so you can see this, chapter 31 says that those words then are from King Lemuel, and they were taught to him by his mother. And so the thing about both of these guys, Agur and King Lemuel, is we have no idea who they are. Um, they, the only things that we know about either one of these guys is in these two headings. Um, and so it's kind of fascinating to study some of the theories of who these guys might be, but that kind of misses the point. The, the point is in, there's one word that's common between those two headings, it shows up in both of them. Both of them say that these words in these two chapters are oracles. And so that, that word oracle there, it means an inspired utterance. So both of these chapters then, chapter 30 and chapter 31, are claiming that God gave these words to these men. So whoever they are, 
God used them to write these words, and then he sovereignly had them included here at the end of the book of Proverbs. And these headings mark these chapters off from what comes before, so that just like the headings marked off the first nine chapters um, from Solomon to his son, and they function as the introduction to, to the Proverbs, these last two chapters, whose authors are connected to a father and a mother, function as the conclusion. And then these last two chapters here then work together to wrap up the book of Proverbs. And so the, the point in all that then is that we ought to read these words from Agur here in chapter 30, just like Tracy mentioned when she was reading this. We ought to read them as the beginning of the conclusion of the book of Proverbs. And so with that in mind, uh, what does Agur have to say here at the end of the book of Proverbs? And so let's, let's read through these first few verses again. Look at the rest of verse 1. First thing that he says the man declares, I am weary, O oh God. I am weary, O oh God, and worn out. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know about you, but I kind of love that that's how the conclusion to Proverbs begins. Uh, like after 29 chapters, nine of pleading to choose the wise path and avoid the foolish path, and then 20 chapters of these wise sayings, unpacking wisdom and folly in real life, Agur says, I'm exhausted. Like, and, so, and the word that he uses here for the man at the beginning of that um, is the word for a young, strong man. So this isn't some old man at the end of his life that, that you would expect to be weary and worn out. Like this is a young, strong man who, would you, who you'd expect to be full of energy saying, I'm weary, I'm worn out. And so that statement, it, it grabs our attention. It causes us to ask why. Like, why is it that he's feeling at this point in the book of Proverbs that he's so weary and so worn out? John's probably thinking he must have had to preach through it, right? Like, uh, uh, so, yeah, but he's going to tell us why. Verse 2, he, look at verse 2. He's going to tell us why he's feeling exhausted. He says in verse 2 here, Surely I am too stupid to be a man. I have not the understanding of a man. Like, wow. I mean, that's, that's a shocking statement at this point in the book as well. Um, so the word translated stupid here in the ESV, it, it means brutish or animal-like. He's basically saying that he feels more animal-like than human. And the second line reinforces that. The, the word man there at the end of that verse um, is a different word than the, the one in verse 1. The word here is just kind of the general generic word for human. So his point is that he doesn't have the understanding that a human should have, and that's part of being human. So he's saying that his lack of understanding leaves him feeling subhuman at this point, which is, which is a really strong statement and sounds really harsh. And it causes us to ask why again, like why in the world is that what he feels? What would, would leave him feeling so ignorant at this point in the book of Proverbs that he would say that he feels less than human? So again, he's going to explain for us. Verse 3, he tells us why he feels this way. Um, he says in verse 3, I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. So basically, there's two things here in this verse that contribute to him feeling less than human. But these two things are closely connected to each other and related to each other. And we've seen that throughout Proverbs, um, where, where two lines of a statement like this parallel each other and build on each other. That's what's going on here as well. The wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One are parallel to each other. So in one sense, they're both referring to the same thing, but they each emphasize a different element. And so if you've been with us along the way in the book of Proverbs, hopefully you know by now that wisdom, that word there, wisdom, is, is skill, right? It's, it's the skill of living consistently with the way that God created the world to work. It's skill in living in God's world under God's authority. So wisdom here emphasizes that skill, Knowledge of the Holy One, then, emphasizes knowing and having a relationship with God. Uh, the only other place in the book of Proverbs where that phrase, knowledge of the Holy One, comes up is back in the introduction, chapter 9, verse 10, which says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. And so that verse connects knowledge of the Holy One to wisdom as well, but it also, the parallel in that verse is the fear of the Lord 
which we've talked about several times, and Andrew just preached on last week. And so the point in that verse is that the fear of the Lord or knowledge of the Holy One is where wisdom begins. So putting all that together then, you could say that knowledge of the Holy One is knowing God rightly and having a relationship with Him that causes us then to fear Him like we should and that causes us to live consistently then with how He created the world to work. And the thing is, that's what this whole book has been about, right? Fear the Lord and pursue wisdom. Those are the two principles that just keep coming up over and over again. And so we've been through 29 chapters then pleading with us to do those two things and showing, what, showing us what that looks like in everyday life. But then here we are at the conclusion of the book and what's the very first thing that we hear? I'm exhausted and I'm less than human because I can't do it. That's what he's saying can't do it. And so at, at one level, that's a shocking way to end the book, right? Like that's a shocking way for the conclusion to begin. But at another level, it shouldn't be shocking at all. Because if we're honest, isn't that what we've all been feeling along the way? I mean, just think back on everything that we've been through over the last several months here in Proverbs. I've, I've flipped back through the different worship guides from Proverbs series and just looked at the titles. Like we've talked about sexual sin, money, laziness, our words and speech, listening to correction, dealing with conflict, planning, friendships, lying and deceit, the poor, parenting, relationships, fighting sin, fear of man. And, and those are just the topics that we devoted whole sermons to. Like there were other sermons that touched on multiple areas of wisdom and pursuing wisdom. And then those are just the verses that we actually focused on. You remember going through this, we were saying every week, like we can't get to all this, we'll be here forever. And we just focused on certain things. So like there, there's a lot of stuff that we, we didn't even get to. And so like it's exhausting just thinking back through everything that we've covered. And then think about how you felt as we went through those topics. Like if, if you're like me, even the ones that when I first saw the titles on Sunday morning and I thought, oh good, this one won't be too convicting because I'm, I'm good in, in this one. I don't struggle with this one too much. Like it, the Lord opened my eyes to how I absolutely do struggle with that. Um, and yeah, anybody else deal with that along the way? Uh, and so I'm not saying that this series has all just been a beating. Um, it, it really, it's been really good. It's been really helpful. And I've seen many ways that I and that we as a church have grown in wisdom as we've gone through this book together. But I, I think the point here at the end of the book of Proverbs is that after studying this book, you're walking away thinking, great, I got it. I can do all of that. Then, then you're completely missing the point. Instead, these, verse, these verses here in chapter 30 give words to the response that we've probably all been feeling, but maybe have been afraid, afraid to say out loud. I can't do it. Like, I've tried and I've failed. I've fallen short of the relationship with God that I ought to have, and I've fallen short of living in his world under his authority the way that I should have. And I'm exhausted from trying. Oh, and the implication of verse 2 then is that that's not how things were meant to be. God created humans to live in relationship with him and then through that relationship to live rightly in this world. So the implication is that when we fall short of those two things, we fall short of who we were made to be. And we know from the storyline of the Bible that that's the result of the fall, that when Adam and Eve chose to disobey God rather than fearing him, their relationship with God was broken and their relationship with the world was broken. And that brokenness has been passed down to all of us. And so here at the end of the book of Proverbs, if we're honest, the first takeaway is that trying to pursue wisdom and live life the wise way that Proverbs has called us to live leaves us exhausted by our lack of wisdom. Merry Christmas, right? Um, I warned you up front. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get worse before it gets better. Um, you can see the second takeaway there on your handout. Second takeaway is, is this, that Proverbs leaves us humbled by the infinite gulf between God and us. Leaves us humbled by the infinite gulf between God and us. That's what we see there in verse 4, which I read back at the beginning. But, but look at this again. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? Surely you know. 
So the thing with this verse is that at first, when you read that, like comes across just as really beautiful, right? And, and reading it from our perspective, we get to those last two questions about what is his name and what is his son's name, and, and we get all excited. I mean, I, I did back when I first read it, thinking about this being our passage for this Sunday, and, and that's great, and, and we're going to get there. But as I've studied this this week, I've realized that I think we, we jump there too quickly with this verse. I think Agur had layers of meaning in mind with this verse. And the first one is probably not the one that we initially jumped to. Um, just, just think about what we talked about in verses one to three there. We just talked about how this young man who's exhausted and feeling subhuman because of his lack of wisdom and how that's what Proverbs ought to leave us all feeling at some level. And so with that in mind, I think the first way that we're supposed to read this verse is with humans in mind, which totally changes the way that you answer these questions here in verse four. And so let's walk through these questions real quick and unpack them just a little bit, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So in verse four here, we've got four who questions followed by two what questions. And so the four who questions are bookended by heaven and earth. And so the first question is asking about who has ascended into heaven and come down. And we get what this question is asking about, right? Like in, in the mindset of people of Agur's day, it might be a little bit different than ours, but for them, heaven was as high up as you could possibly go. Like that's the limit, as high up as you can possibly go is heaven. Heaven is also the dwelling place of God. And so the question here is who has traveled up to heaven, the highest place you can go and met with God and then come back to tell us about it. Like people have tried. Remember the story of the Tower of Babel from Genesis 11? Humanity tried to rebel against God's command to spread out and fill the earth. Instead, they decided to all work together and build themselves a tower up to the heavens to ascend to heaven, right? Like, how'd that go for them, though, if you know that story? The, the way the story is told in Genesis, like, it mocks them. <laughs> it says, God came down to see the tower that they built, like, they think they're building this tower up to God's dwelling place, and God has to, like, stoop down and squint his eyes to see this puny little thing that they've constructed. Like, they're not even close to ascending to heaven. And then he confused their languages and halted their little construction project and forced them to spread out over the face of the earth like he told them to in the first place. So, so that's the answer to that question. Who's ascended to heaven and come down? No one. No human can do that, not even if we all work together. That, that's the answer to the first question. What about the earth question, the, one, the, the fourth who question there? If the heavens are as far up as you can go, the ends of the earth are as far away as you can go. And so I know in our modern age, it's hard for us to understand in some sense like how unfathomable it would have been for Agur to think about ever reaching the ends of the earth, much less having anything to do with establishing them or creating them in the first place. But even now, I mean, just think about this, even now where we can travel pretty much anywhere in the world in a couple of days, there are still depths of the ocean in remote places on earth that few people, if anyone, has ever seen, much less that we had anything to do with establishing. So, so that's the answer to that question too. Who, who's established the ends of the earth? No human has done that. No one, nobody can do that. Then you have the two questions in the middle about wind and waters. And th this is not just some random pair of words here. These are significant symbols in the Bible. Just think back to creation in the very beginning. Think about what the earth was like before God began his creating work. Genesis 1-2 says the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So the earth, before God began his creating work, was, began covered in water. And so in the minds of people in the Old Testament, water symbolized that pre-creation chaos. And just think about then some of the other places that water comes up in some key stories along the way in the Old Testament. Noah and the flood, right? The waters are the judgment of God and basically return the earth to its pre-creation state. Moses and the Red Sea, again, the waters come crashing down in judgment on the Egyptians. They're like That's what water symbolizes throughout the Bible, chaos and judgment. 
Think back again to Genesis, though. What else was present at the beginning? So you had water. You also had the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. And so the word for spirit there, it's the same word here as the word for wind. It can be translated either way depending on the context. So, so in the beginning, you had water and you had wind. You had the Spirit. And the, the wind or the Spirit indicated the beginning of God's creative work. Like he's beginning to move and he's going to begin creating. He's about to bring order and life out of the chaos. Think about the flood again. The same thing comes up there. When God's judgment was over and the flood was about to recede, Genesis 8.1 says that God made a wind blow over the water. Um, And that's supposed to take us back to Genesis 1. We're supposed to see this as a, a new creation beginning. Then with the Red Sea, the wind opened the waters so that the Israelites could cross on dry ground and and live instead of being killed by the Egyptians. So these two symbols go together. Water is connected with chaos and judgment. Wind is connected with creation and life. And so think about these these, these two questions here then in light of that. Both of these questions in Proverbs 30 verse 4 have to do with being able to contain and control the wind and the water. Like, who can gather up the wind in their fists? I mean, like, you can try, right? Like, you can try to gather it up, but, but you can't do it. It's not possible. And, and like we just saw, wind carries way more significance than just not being able to grab the air. The other question, who can wrap up the water in their garments? The, the picture there is like trying to lift up the front of your shirt or, or like a long robe and, and contain all the water in the earth basically in your lap. Like, who can do that? And again, given the significance of what water symbolizes, like who would be brave enough to try? So again, the answer to both these questions is no human can do that. Like we can't do it. It's not possible. And, and so that's the, that's the same thing when we get into the what questions as well. Like if the, if the four who questions are all first about humans and our inability to do these things, that's the first thing that we should have in mind with the two what questions as well. What's the name of the, of the human that can do these things? I can't tell you because he doesn't exist. What's his son's name? I can't tell you because he doesn't exist. That's, that's the way that, the first, or that these questions here in verse 4 function. They flow out of verses 1 to 3 to deepen even farther our sense of our lack of wisdom. But like I said, these, these questions have layers. So the other way that we're drawn to answer them is correct as well. No human can do these things, but God can, right? We can't ascend to heaven, but God can come down to us. Who can contain and control the wind? God can. Who can contain and control the waters? God can. Who has established all the ends of the earth? God has. What's his name? The Lord. That's how we answer these questions as well. The prophet Amos answers some similar questions. I love how he says it. Just a few different verses in his book that that address some similar questions and answer this question for us. He says, For behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what is his thought, who makes the morning darkness and treads the height of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. He who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns deep darkness into the morning and darkens the day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. Who builds his upper chambers in the heaven and founds his vault upon the earth. Who calls for the water of the sea and pours them out upon the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. Like that's the other way to answer what is his name here. It's the Lord. And so the thing is the ability to contain and control creation all the way up as high as it goes and all the way out as far as it goes is the ultimate expression of wisdom, right? In his commentary on this verse, Bruce Waltke says, God's total sovereignty over the universe expresses his wisdom. Wisdom is not simply about the power to discern, but the capacity to manage and control. Like, that's what wisdom ultimately is. And again, all what, that, what that does is just reinforce, again, our lack of wisdom. And so in answering all these questions these two ways, what we're left feeling is, is this infinite gulf between God and us. We can't do any of these things. God alone can do them all. That's how vast the chasm is between us. And that's what Agur is confessing here at the conclusion of Proverbs. The presentation of wisdom in this book has left him feeling the infinite gulf between God and us. And it ought to do that for us as well. 
And so, again, if you've gone through this study and your first reaction is like, yeah, I can do that. I can, I can do those things. You've missed the point. Because the reality is not only have we not lived up to the wisdom presented in this book, we've proven ourselves to be the fools that Proverbs warns about. So it's not just that God is ultimately wise and we're just a little bit less wise than he is. We're just not as wise as he is. It's that God is ultimately wise and we are the exact opposite. Like we have rejected his wisdom and sought to define wisdom for ourselves, which is huge because I skipped over the other answer to the second what question there. If the answer to the question, what is his name, is the Lord, then in the context of Proverbs, the answer to the question, what is his son's name, ought to be me, right? Think back to Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. It says, my son, do not de- despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. So yes, Proverbs is about Solomon instructing his son in the way of wisdom, but more than that, it's God instructing his sons in the way of wisdom. So here at the end of the book of Proverbs, the answer to what is his son's name ought to be me. It ought to be I am his son because I am learning wisdom from him. But verse three here leads us to confess that we haven't done that. We haven't learned wisdom. So how can we answer the question the way that we ought to if we failed to live as wise sons? How can we answer this question the way that we ought to if there's this infinite gulf between God and us? And that's what leads to the third takeaway here. You can see that next on your handout. The third takeaway is that Proverbs leaves us longing for someone who can rescue us from who we are and restore us to who we were meant to be. Like that's the whole point in dragging out these first two takeaways like we have is to lead us to feel this point right here. Like this is why this is such an appropriate Advent passage because it helps us confess who we are in and of ourselves. That we are not wise. We can't live up to the wisdom laid out in Proverbs. In fact, we've done the exact opposite. We've chosen the foolish path and we deserve the consequences for that choice. We deserve all the consequences promised to the fool throughout this book, and we deserve death because that's the end of the foolish path. But these verses also help us feel that this is not the way that things were meant to be. Like we saw in verse two, we were made to live in relationship with God and to live, con- live consistently with how he created the world to work under his authority. Like that's how things were supposed to be. And so we feel the longing for things to be made right, for for us to be made right. But we're left with this deep understanding that there's no way that we can do that ourselves. And I said the Advent's about hopeful longing. So here's how what sounds like a hopeless confession leads to hopeful longing. Paul Tripp in his Advent devotional, Come Let Us Adore Him, he says, the Christmas story confronts us with our inability Because if we had any ability whatsoever to save ourselves from sin, the birth of Jesus would not have been necessary. The Christmas story reminds us that hopelessness is the only doorway to true and eternal hope. It's only when you give up on you that you seek and celebrate what God in his holy love offers you in the person and work of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Like that's what Proverbs does for us and what the beginning of Proverbs 30 does for us. It leaves us with no hope in ourselves so that our hope can be placed in someone else who can rescue us from who we are and restore us to who we were meant to be. And that leads us to the final takeaway and how Proverbs ultimately prepares us for Christmas. And you see this next. It's that Proverbs points us to Jesus who fulfills the longings that Proverbs leaves us with. Oh, now we can finally get to where we first wanted to go when I read verse four back at the beginning. Um, Because while Agur had layers in mind with verse 4, there's a layer that he couldn't have seen from his perspective that we can see now from ours. And so again, look back at verse 4 one more time and think about how it points us to Jesus, knowing what we know now from this side of his birth. So think about these questions one more time. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Jesus. Jesus is God himself come down to dwell with us. Matthew 1, 22 and 23, the angels just told Joseph in a dream about the baby that's gonna be born to Mary. And what does Matthew say about that baby? 
It says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. John chapter one says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Like we can't ascend to heaven and come down, so Jesus took on flesh and came down to dwell with us. Oh, and not only has Jesus, God himself, come down to dwell with us, he's opened up access for us to God. Like the picture of ascending and coming down brings to mind the story of Jacob in Genesis. He's fleeing from his brother Esau after deceiving him out of his birthright and his blessing. And one night out in the middle of nowhere with a stone for his pillow, Jacob dreams of a ladder or a staircase reaching from that place up to heaven and angels ascending and descending on this staircase. And Jacob wakes up and he says in Genesis 28, 16 and 17, he says, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. And he names that place Bethel, which means the house of God. And so then fast forward to the book of John chapter one, Philip brings his friend Nathaniel to Jesus. Nathaniel's skeptical about what he's heard about Jesus, but before he can even say anything, Jesus reveals some information about Nathaniel that no one else could know. And Nathaniel's just immediately amazed and convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. Do you remember how Jesus responded to Nathaniel? John chapter one, verse 50 says, Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You'll see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Like Jesus is basically saying, that ladder that Jacob saw in his dream back in Genesis, that's me. I'm the bridge between heaven and earth. I'm the gate of heaven. So Jesus is God come down from heaven to dwell with us, and he's the one who opens up the way for us to follow him there. What about those next questions? Who's gathered up the wind in his fists? Who's wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who can control and contain the wind and the waters? Jesus can. Luke chapter eight, starting verse 22. Can't do better than just reading this one. One day, Jesus got into the boat with his disciples. He said to them, let us go across the other side of the lake. So they set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him saying, master, master, we're perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, where's your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even the winds and water, and they obey him? Who can do that? Jesus can do that. He can contain and control the wind. He can contain and control the waters. He commands, and they obey what about the last question there? Who's established all the ends of the earth? Jesus. John 1 again, verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1, 15 to 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Like Jesus has established the ends of the earth. They were all created through him and he sustains them all. So then when we get to that final question, what is his son's name? His name is Jesus Luke chapter one, behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God. Jesus is the son of God. And he proves it by doing all these things that no human, but only God can do. Oh, and here's the most incredible part about all this, because Jesus was born of a woman, so not only is he the son of God, he's also a human. But he's not less than human in the way verse two talked about, because verse three was not true of him. He did know and have a relationship with the Father, and he did learn wisdom. He perfectly lived consistently with the way that God created the world to work. 
And he came down and was born as a human so that he could live that perfectly wise life as our substitute and then take the consequences of our foolishness on himself and die in our place. He was born so that he could live and so that he could die as our substitute. But he didn't stay dead. He was raised to life as the firstborn of a new restored creation and a new restored humanity that's no longer broken by Adam's fall. And so now in him, we can be rescued from who we are and restored to who we were meant to be. And so now all who place their faith in Jesus as their substitute receive transformed hearts that no longer are trapped by the path of folly, but by the power of the Spirit living in us, we begin to learn wisdom and grow in the knowledge of the Holy One. Now we no longer feel less than human because we're being restored to true humanity. Now we no longer have to be exhausted by the book of Proverbs. Instead, the book of Proverbs stirs us up to love the wisdom presented here and to walk in the path of wisdom that leads to life because that's who we are now in Jesus. Like that's how Jesus is the one who fulfills the longings that Proverbs leave us with. That's how Proverbs prepares us for Christmas. A Christian, it reminds us that apart from Jesus, Proverbs exhausts us by our lack of wisdom and humbles us by the infinite gulf between God and us. And it reminds us of the longing that we felt before we knew Jesus for someone who would rescue us from who we were and who would restore us to who we were meant to be. And as we meditate on that, it stirs our hearts with joy as we celebrate the birth of our Savior. Oh, and if you're not a Christian, I pray that these takeaways have stirred your heart with longing to be rescued from who you are and restored to who you're meant to be. Like Jesus is the one that fulfills those longings. Oh, trust in him. Put your hope in him. And if that's you, we're so glad that you're here with us this morning. We'd love to talk to you after the service about how all of this can be true for you and how you can celebrate Christmas in a whole new way this year. Oh, but I can't think of a better way to close and all, after all this than, than to read this from Matthew chapter one. Now, the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Let's pray. Father, thank you for how the book of Proverbs points us to that. Um, that all we've walked through in this book, um, it's done us a lot of good. Um, it's, it's challenged us in some ways that we've needed along the way. Um, it's pointed us to true wisdom. It's given us a heart that loves what that picture is and desires to live the wise life that um, has been presented in this book. But at the same time, in so many ways, Father, it's left us feeling what Agura confesses at the beginning here of chapter 30, that we're exhausted. We can't do it. We've tried and we've failed. We can't, we can't live up to this. It leaves us worn out with our lack of wisdom and it leaves us just humbled before the infinite gulf between you and us. Oh, but that's exactly what we need. Just how in this book, the, the consistent pattern throughout it has been, be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. And it leaves us with those two things, just not able to be wise in our own eyes. And, and humbled before you and fearing you rightly. And that is what the book tells us is the beginning of wisdom. And so this is exactly where we need to be at this point. And so thank you for how it prepares us in that way. But just your timing in this, Father, is just so kind to have us here the week leading up to Christmas um, to prepare our hearts to celebrate the birth of Jesus and all that that means for us. Lord, just reminding us of, of how our only hope is not in ourselves, not in our own ability to live the wise life that you call us to live, but in his work in our place, his life in our place, his death in our place, that he's the one who fulfills everything that Proverbs points us to. And so, Father, we, we just ask that you would do what needs to be done in our hearts this week as we continue this season of anticipation, of waiting, of longing, 
Uh, Lord, help us to pause, to not get so caught up in, in the joy and the celebration yet that we miss out on preparing our hearts in the way that we should so that on Christmas um, that, that joy is just felt in a deep and, and more rich way than if we just jump straight there. And so, Lord, just for all of us in this room this morning, I pray that that's what this passage has done for us and that it would cause us to, to just feel the longing that we ought to feel um, as we get ready to celebrate your, your great gift to us in Jesus who fulfills all the longings that, that we need um, and that the book of Proverbs have been pointing us to. Um, pray these things in Jesus' name.